up, 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 up. There's that. Here's that. Start. Access to this there we go. is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss S you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell more information to anyone. All right. So <clears throat> let's see what is what is going on in the world. We are oh <laughs> let's see. Randy says, I'm fortunate to have all I need at home. The market, the markets and road biking take up most of my time. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, well, I'm glad if, I'm glad you're adapting also. But yeah, I'm good. I'm I mean I have my I have my nice bike. I have a nice electric bike, which I also can, you know, which is pedalable. Um, so I I do manage to get out once in a while and just tour the the disaster area. But then I'm getting now lately I've been getting pissed off because there's so many people in town. Um you know, I live in Delray Beach in Florida. It's a tourist town, um, and 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 a, 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 it's a tourist town, like it's a, a rich tourist town. So the people who live here generally have small refrigerators and and eat out all the time. I mean, so the, you know, the, the, our town has two hundred restaurants. Uh, it's it's uh, li it's it's literally like a mile up to the, it's a mile from my house to the beach. And there's one main drag, and there's 200 restaurants pretty much along the way. So it's just nothing but bars and restaurants in this town. And um, so it's not really a town for people who want quiet, and it's not a town for people who are are looking to stay at home and 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 shelter in place. It's a lot further to the supermarkets than it is to any of the restaurants. Um, but they but but there there's a scary amount of people who are just basically don't care at all anymore just you know or they're out and they're just deciding they're gonna go and do things and walk around town and not wear a mask and whatever in fact i went biking on sunday i drew i went several miles and i i counted i didn't count but i mean i was i saw i saw at least a couple of hundred people that i went past and this is like first thing sunday morning but I went past at least a couple of hundred people and one person was had a mask on. And it wasn't me. Because <laughs> I, I was on my bike. I wasn't planning on visiting any stores or anything. But, you know, every single other person, all the people walking around town and everything else, nobody had a mask. So, I I mean, I mean, it's it's what we talked about, though. It's what I predicted. It's what I said when I figured out. I, and again, time, I have no idea what time things happen. But I remember being on... on um, on Money Talk a couple of weeks ago. And um, at the time, I, that's when I came up with my theory. I was thinking very hard about what I thought was going to happen. And I decided that what's going to happen is it's going to break down. And, and, and it's happening the way I thought, but it's scary to see it happening because ultimately what I think is going to happen is, is you can't stop it. The younger people are going to say, screw this, and they're going to go out and 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 enjoy, you know, they're going to go out and take the take the country back effectively. And it's not so much, well, I was going to say it's not so much Trump's thing, but it is Trump's thing. But it's it, it goes back to it's like because the president is telling you it's okay to do it, that makes it really hard for anybody else to enforce anything else. So in other words, your governor looks like an asshole if he's not letting you out. Your parents look like assholes. Your local 
mayors look like assholes. If the, if you don't have the backing of the president of the United States, if he doesn't even have the the decency to say your local leaders are best equipped to make these decisions, we will, uh, you know, we respect their decisions. If that if you can't even get that out of the president of the United States, you are in big trouble. And that's where we are. I mean, we and I and, I, and we knew this a few weeks ago when I said that people are going to start saying in groups they're going to say fuck it and. Where did I write that up? I wrote I wrote it, but they wouldn't. Now on um, on BNN they wouldn't uh, say <laughs> they they wouldn't even say they told me that they couldn't even use the word "fuck it." <laughs> yeah, it's a place in Thailand. Um, it wasn't last week; it must have been the week before. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh. Was it not April 22nd? Wow. April 15th? When the hell was I on that show? Oh, 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 I might be wrong because of, um, Eric. I don't remember. I don't know if anybody remembers when I was on the show. I, I think it's because I didn't write it on Wednesday. I wrote the article on Monday or something like that. That's why I'm getting confused. Very easily confused these days with, see, time. Time is losing its meaning, unfortunately. But anyhow, all right, well, <clears throat> point being, summary of what I said at the time is, you don't have, because you don't have the support of the government and because you have things like the Republicans in certain states are suing the governors to reopen, uh, even if the governors want to stay closed, there's, there, there's Republicans suing uh, their, their state government to say, no, you can't do this to us. You have to let us go. You don't have a reason to unreasonably lock us in, blah, blah, blah. The science isn't concise. Well, you know, same bullshit they always use for everything. Um, so therefore, what's going to happen? Well, if, if you have a, a situation of chaos like this, then people are going to start doing what they want to do. Everybody's going to decide for themselves. But the problem is that they're not deciding for themselves because ultimately they're deciding for, for me and for, and for anybody else who wants to stay home because the young people, I have the number, I'm so upset, I don't know what the article is. The, the young people... Are going to uh, go out, and so let's say people under um, under 25 for sure are going to immediately, basically, go out. In 75, 80 percent of them are going to start going out again. Um, once they go out, and, my, and this is my daughter's age group, I mean, once they go out, then they come home, and the parents are like, "Well, now I've been exposed to all of her friends, and she go, you know, she went to this place, and she went to that place, and you know what's going to happen? They come back. Oh, I'm being careful. It's like you can't be careful if you're in a group of 20 people. You're not being careful. You already failed to be careful, because any one of those 20 people who wasn't careful can lead to exposure. This is why we have such a problem with viruses. Um, so." You, your risk of exposure just skyrockets as a, as a, as a parent of young kids. Um, the, the, so what's going to happen then though is basically people under 45 generally feel like they're not going to they're not very likely to get heavily infected. Although we've had people specifically tell us members of our in our service that have specifically said this really was horrible. I went through it. It's like we we've heard these stories and that's you know just in our little group. So. It's not nothing, and people don't realize that, and it's hard to realize that until you start knowing people who have it, but by then it's too late, because by the time by the time everybody knows somebody who has it, that means everybody's pretty much gonna be exposed by then. Um, but anyway, so then you now you're into a position where basically everybody under 45 starts going out again. That, that right there is more than half of our population. Our population is, is basically uh, it, it fluctuates, but there's basically 3 million people per year. No, I'm sorry, 4 million people per year. There's 4 million people per year between the ages of zero and 75. 
that's if you want to roughly guess where it is obviously there's less people who are 75 and whatever but for, for argument's sake you can almost say there's four million in the age group so when you say one to four when you say one to 45 are going to go out um that's going to be um 45 times four is 180 million people are going to be back out leaving 150 million people not necessarily back out but of those 150 million people you've got probably 40 million people between the ages of 45 and 65 who have to go out because um they just can't afford to stand anymore because they have to work they can't the bills that come bill nobody's forgiving the bills your bills are still coming in you still have things you got to pay for uh, a huge percentage of the population lives paycheck to paycheck you simply can't afford not to go back to work and especially if half the people start going back to work because you'll just lose your job. You'll possibly be like, oh, well, can't show up. You're out. I have, you know, I, I had to lay off people. You're going to be one of them since you can't show up. So people are going to be forced to go back to work. So now you've got 180 million people below 45 going back to work. You've got 40 million people above 45 to 65 going back to work. That's 220 million people. That leaves just 100 million people in lockdown. And of those, you're going to have 30% of the of the uh, Make America Great Again types who are going to go out because they just don't believe in this stuff. They're, just, they're not going to listen. That's 30 million people. Now you're left with only 60, 70 million people, 20% of the population, who are willing to stay, who want, who want to be sure before they start running out and risking their lives because they're at-risk people, because they have health conditions, because they're older, because they don't want to get sick um for whatever reasons so what happens then and this is the point that it all starts with this breakdown it all starts with the 500 people that were lined up a block away from my house at a mexican restaurant to get because it was cinco de mayo and they were and they had a special and everybody wanted to bring food home for their family so five so they had a lot of 500 people waiting to pick up food for dinner um that that's insane Great for the restaurant, but insane for the world. So they're removing my choice. These guys are a block away from my house. They're effectively removing my choice. They're they're in my area and, and spreading germs and whatever and, and infecting each other and spreading the virus. By the time you have 80% of the people who are going back to normal, where's the benefit to a restaurant in servicing me? Is the restaurant, because for a restaurant to be virus free, they have to make sure they have a virus free staff and they have to go through protocols and clean and so on and so forth and do all this stuff. But if 80% of their customers don't give a crap, it's not worth it for the restaurant to maintain themselves virus free and not service 80% of the people who want to go there. So when I call and I say, are you following all the virus protocols? And they'll be like, no, what are you crazy? We're, we want to be in business. We want to survive. So there's going to be fewer at all. What's going to happen is my choices will be taken away. My There won't be a supermarket I can go to to shop. There won't be a, a, a places to deliver. Uh, you know, Uber, may, now maybe some delivery services and some restaurants and some shops will say, hey, there's a market servicing the shut-ins. And maybe they'll specifically be there for the shut-ins, but that's going to be a random, weird sort of thing that happens that some people make that leap. But even so, the the chance of remaining unexposed, as 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 eighty percent of the people just decide they don't care if they get exposed, is going to be very slim. It's going to be you're going to be like Howard Hughes. I mean, that's that's the thing. If you really want to avoid being exposed, you're going to have to be the psychopath that's hiding behind five layers of barriers. Most people can't afford to live like that. You know, where people like Howard Hughes never let anybody hand him anything directly. He had everything had to have a cleaning protocol before it came near him and whatever. He was a he was a psychotic germaphobe. Um, it's almost rational <laughs> to be that way now, but who can afford it? And who and who wants to be though? On the other hand, though, I you know at, at a certain point, and that's where it gets to you. I'd say, well, if that's going to be my life, ah. And and I and that's how you end up being one. You know, after a while, that eighty percent starts breaking down to the twenty percent starts breaking down too. Because after a while, you say, well, okay, so I've got to live a life of self imprisonment, out of fear of getting a virus, or or for maybe two years until you get a cure, or I'm going to go outside and take my chances and get sick and and hopefully not die. 
and and the death rate's like you know one percent. If you're a normal person uh, below, if you're above sixty five, you're in big trouble. But if you're a normally healthy person uh, below sixty five, you 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 know even even forty five to sixty five, you only have about a one percent chance of dying. So that's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a lot more than my usual chance of dying when I go out. Like, I mean, I do I go out a hundred times a year. I go out two hundred times a year, and I don't expect to die. And I do that for twenty straight years, and I don't expect to die because your chance of dying uh, prematurely just because you went out is not that high. Yet this is much 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 higher than normal. But still. The bottom line is, from our point of view, investing-wise, the economy will open up. You can't stop it. It's like the tide. You can't, unless you, unless the president has a huge change of heart and says, oh, my God, we were so wrong. <laughs> Good luck, right? Unless the president says, oh, my God, we were so wrong. We have to shut things down and follow these protocols very seriously. This virus is getting much worse than we thought. Blah, blah, blah. Unless all that happens, then, then forget it. Then things are going to open up, and everyone will get sick eventually, and you'll either survive or you won't. And that's where we are. But from an investing standpoint, so we may as well worry about the investment, not worry about the rest of it. That means the economy is going to going to get almost back to normal over the course of the next uh, six to nine months, and therefore the economic damage is not that severe. So then we have to focus when we're looking at each individual company on, well, how badly did the virus actually damage these companies? And and if it, and, and, it, and we have to then determine if, we, if they're worth holding based on that. Now, in a lot of cases, the damage is cash. So the company, you know, has, has lost cash, obviously, because they have losses, and if the loss is cash, though, like Apple never gets credit for the cash it has on hand. It's never valued. So now, and, and, and lose money yet. So that's beside the point. Let's say Disney. Don't look at Disney and value it for its cash. Um, Disney, 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 Yahoo, Yahoo. Okay, here we go. Disney. So here's Disney. And Disney is a $182 billion company. Currently, they say they have a PE of 17. Financially, though, they made $11 billion and $12 billion. So they make $10, $12 million. They make at least $10 billion a year. All right. So they're not really that cheap. So 182. If you if you go down 10, they they are trading at 17 times PE. If you if you assume that that's where they're going to be, they're 182 billion. They're they're trading 18 times their earnings, which is actually kind of high for most companies now. So you have to think whether you have to take it with a grain of salt. But the but the thing is, ordinarily you would take into account the fact that on their balance sheet, they've got not current assets. They got five billion in cash. And they don't seem to have any short-term investments. So they only have five billion in cash. So maybe Disney's not the best example, but the bottom line is you're not really valuing the cash in the company. Um, they are weird, huh? No short-term investments. That's odd. <laughs> All right. Anyway. So nobody nobody cares about the five billion cash. So if they lose three billion dollars over the next quarter, and then they bounce back after that, then the parks reopen and things get back to normal. So if they lose three billion dollars, what's the difference? It doesn't change the company. They're they're slowly they built this cash in 2018. They had four billion. Now they have 5.4 billion. So in a normal year. They might add a billion dollars to the bottom line. This is because they had a great movie year, by the way. So in a normal year, maybe they add a billion dollars to the bottom line. So, me, so meanwhile, their cash goes from 5.4 to 2.4 billion dollars in 2020. And then 
What's the difference? Because it's going to go back up a billion a year after that. And it affects no effect whatsoever on the company's profitability or anything else. They just took some of the cash out of the bank, which is what companies should have. They should have the cash for a rainy day. You don't expect a rainy day to be a complete shutdown of your company for three months, but any company should have money aside for emergencies, and you never know what those emergencies are going to be. Um, frankly, if I were Disney, I'm wondering if I would have predicted that. Let's, I mean, I certainly would be prepared for a terrorist attack, and a terrorist attack would shut the park for a certain amount of time. Like, let's say a bomb blows up in Disney, specifically in Disney. That would shut your parks down for at least a month, maybe a couple of months. You'd have to put in protocols, blah, 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 before people came back. But it would not necessarily shut down ESPN and shut down all production of all movies and so on and so forth. That That's beyond what anybody would expect. You could even expect an atomic bomb to blow up in a city. It still wouldn't shut down your worldwide production of films and shut down every sporting event on on the planet and so on and so forth. You know, it just it's hard to imagine this happening. This is a new thing we've never worried about before that the entire planet could be shut down at the same time. And unfortunately for Disney, everything they do is pretty much related to entertainment. Now, the only good thing they have going for them is ABC is doing well. The uh, the Disney subscription service is going well. The Disney Channel is going well. They have their content marketing is going well, but um, but but obviously parks wise, total disaster. But then the question is, what's the actual long term damage? Because you can shut Disney down, and they could lose money. For a year, for two years, um, I don't know what the number was. I wasn't. Uh, let me see. They they pulled guidance, so it's hard to say where they're at. But let's take. I think I, I think we were doing the math on that, but I forgot what it was. Um, Disney Shanghai opening on the 11th. 93 design, not as bad as it looks. So. Many Disney numbers, do, but no, okay. Blah, 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 blah. Disney's earnings from operations crashed, so net profits fell to seventy-five million. Now, look at that's from ten billion dollars, or I'm, I'm sorry, not in a quarter. It's from, um, from, from. Well, how, how are they saying this? That's kind of weird. Oh well. Um, impact on operating income of parks and product segment was one billion dollars. Um, primarily due to revenue lost as a result, blah, 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 hold the virus. So foregone profits, but that's, they're, they're bitching about how many profits they didn't make. They still made $500 million. They just could have made 2 billion, they're saying, which is right. They made two and a half billion dollars a quarter. Um, Okay, the gap numbers, if you turn the page from the income statement, the picture looks brighter. Disney generated more than 1.9 billion in free cash flow. Isn't that crazy? Still generated 1.9 billion in free cash flow um, because they had to they had to discount and write things down and so on and so forth. Um, that number's down 30% from last year. So basically they had a 30% decline and they got hit very hard. And that means that in the following eight weeks, they're gonna have also severe declines, probably. All of it. I'd say, I, I don't think, I can't see how they could possibly make money. They probably, like I said, they're probably going to take a loss. It's probably going to be a couple of billion dollars. Um, so they're going to, they only made five. So they didn't make 1.5 million now. They're only going to make, uh, they're going to lose 2 billion, let's say, next quarter. So instead of making 5 billion, they're going to lose 2.5 billion dollars. That means in the next two quarters, even if they got back to normal, which they won't, they would only make um, 5 billion dollars back. And they'd still be heavily in the hole. Then they'd be down. Then they'd have a year of two and a half billion. Maybe the year's going to end up netting zero. But you know what? So what? Because next year, if 
things are back to normal. And by the way, things will be back to normal because you have that thing called herd immunity. So the, the, the upside economically to this thing is if everybody gets exposed and if 2% of the people die, then you move on from there. Just like we moved on from the, we didn't, nobody had a vaccine for the 1918 pandemic. And there was no cure. We sheltered in place and stopped it from, by sheltering in place for three months in 1918, we slowed the spread of the disease, allowed people to develop their immunities. And then when you go back out, again, when I go back, you know, when I go back out, you know, in a few weeks, if, uh, you know, look, assuming we don't relock up and things are open for a few weeks, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that the 80% of the people who are going back out already ahead of me will probably have one third of them to one one third of them or more will already have been infected. Okay, so there'll be a big spike in in hospitalizations, big spike in deaths, and so on and so forth. But the the bright side is though that that half the people I come in contact with are not able to give me the disease anymore, at least half. And that's true of the half that haven't gotten the disease yet. They're less likely to get it from someone else. That means the virus will now spread very, very slowly through the rest of society. It will take a lot longer to infect everybody and get around to everybody. And it may not get around to some people at all, just like there's some years you don't get the flu. Some years you get the flu, some years you don't get the flu. It's the same thing. It's not because you're actively uh, uh, freaking out and staying home and not coming in contact with people, blah, blah, blah. It's because you just didn't happen to get it. Statistically, people, not everybody's going to get it. So if you, let, if you let the vast majority of society build up a herd immunity, then your chance of going out and getting it any given day becomes much, much less. Not that you still are not very likely to get it if you, if you get exposed, but there are less and less people exposed. So they said, Number we've been talking about, where I said, once you get below one in five, once more than one in 500 people are actively infected, you are in big trouble because just going out in a, in a decent sized city, uh, not, not a decent, in a town, as long as you're in a town with a few thousand people, um, you're just coming in contact with way too many potential people who are infected. If you just go to the grocery store and stuff, you're coming across a place where hundreds of people touch things and, and breathe the air and so on and so forth. So it becomes very hard to avoid. But if now half of those people already had the virus, now it cuts down how many people could expose you on any given day. So what I'm saying is that one way or another, things are going to open up for good or bad. And if, and, and if it's for bad, we're going to have another spike in disease. If it's such a bad spike, though, and, so, and the infections are so bad and the deaths are so high. And, and by the way, so high does not mean a million. A million is not so high. A million is what the White House expects to have. They are in the one to two. They are <clears throat> they are pursuing this policy knowing full well that there will be one to two million deaths. They're willing to sacrifice those one to two million people for their economy. And uh, Jean-Luc made a point yesterday. He said, well, there's also the possibility, though, that you could try not to say you could sacrifice the economy and still everybody gets sick. So, and that's true. If you look at, if you made a, um, a Venn diagram and you say, and you said to yourself, these are the possibilities in those boxes, and you said, um, well, okay, we could we could attempt not to get infected, but that's not realistic. It's not going to happen. People will get infected. <clears throat> And forever you will have this lurking virus problem because there will always be some people infected. And, and we started with five. We started with one, apparently. But I mean, you, see, you know, we really started with five back in the, when the hell was that? February. So in February, we had like five cases in the U.S. Those five cases turned into 1.2 million. You only need one or two people infected for the whole thing to start up again. So if you don't have a vaccine and you don't have herd immunity, Anytime you reopen, you're, you're, you're subjecting the people to being infected. And it's not just we, the U.S., it's then what? Everybody, nobody's going to be able to go to, to Europe or to China or to Asia. Nobody will travel and nobody will come here. Are you going to completely isolate the United States because we're not immune to a virus that the rest of the world is sharing? You know, again, silly, not going to happen. You know, um, I think that 
if it was if it was worse than the disease is, if it was going to kill more than a couple of percent of the people, I think that they might consider trying trying hard to make a vaccine before they ease the lockdown. But but there this is not economically feasible. They're not going to do it. They're not going to they're not going to create a depression globally in order to save a few million people. It's not it's not an economic choice they're willing to make. And I'm not saying they should. People die. If they never come up with a vaccine, if it turns out like the like the common cold, well, they have a, I mean they have a flu vaccine. So it, it works kind of well. It works pretty good. Well, you know, some people swear by it. Some people said, damn, I got a vaccine, I got sick anyway. Um so if they have a vaccine, great, but that doesn't mean nobody's ever gonna get sick from this again. But it does it does help, obviously. It helps you get rid of it. Nobody, you know, the 1918 influenza went away. It didn't go away. It killed everybody who was susceptible. It, it killed millions and millions of people. It killed the people who, who were susceptible to it. And then that was it because everybody had a re, had resistance from then on. And so the viruses had to had to mutate for another hundred years until they figured out what they could, you know, to come up with this one. Um, but this is minor by comparison. And so things will get back to normal one way or another. Things will get back to normal. And there you, and that and therefore, like a neutron bomb, right? You can kill Disney's business for a year, but does a year stop them from being Disney? Does a year void their copyrights? Does a year take away the contracts that ESPN has for sports? Does it take away the subscribers to all their uh, channels? Does it take away uh, the parks themselves? Do the roller coasters fall apart? Do the rides fall apart? Um, do people do people no longer respond to the brand of Disney and so on and so forth? Mm -mm. It's all still there, ready to go as soon as they open back up. And, and in fact, if I'm going to take my family on vacation and I have to choose between uh, a random hotel in Key West or Disney's old Key West Resort, where Disney puts out some advertisements and, and pamphlets saying, we follow these protocols to protect your family, blah, 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 which you know they're gonna do, that's gonna be a marketing advantage for people like Disney. Marriott, Hyatt, people are gonna be able to do, the big hotel chains are gonna be able to do that and say, we follow these protocols, we are a gigantic corporation, and you can trust us to take care of you and your family when you travel and our kitchens are sparkly clean and blah, blah, blah. All those are very appealing. I want to travel. I don't want to live like this the rest of my life. But when I travel, I am damn well going to go to a really good hotel where I feel that they do a good job of, of uh, making sure that, the, that the, the last tourist in there doesn't infect me, that they change all the sheets, that they do this, that they scan or whatever they do. Um, there's going to be a whole new market for stuff like that, for, for like super cleanings. And maybe they'll tack on 10 bucks for my hotel fee or whatever. I don't what I don't give a crap. It's gonna, it's certainly gonna cost more. Just like 9-11, it costs us more for airport security. It's gonna cost us more now for airport cleaning and airplane cleaning. Just gonna get added onto the fares. And it's gonna turn into a very profitable, just like TSA, it's gonna turn into a very profitable uh uh business for somebody. You know, some people are going to make a lot of money on airline disinfecting and things like that. There's this really cool robot that, like, um, it, it um, come on, what does it do? It, like, laser zaps viruses, like, detects, I, I'm not sure exactly how it works. It, like, somehow detects all viruses in a room or all pathogens in a room, and it um, disinfects it with, like, ultraviolet light and some other stuff and, and even lasers and everything. So they just stick this thing in a room and it scans all the surfaces and it, like, looks for anything that's in any way shaky and it disinfects, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so, you know, we're just going to have to go that way. You know, I'm, I'm my uh, brother has a friend and he's got a, a cleaning service that that can guarantee that your car can that that when it, when you sell a used car when you sell your car back to the dealership they the dealership can then have it serviced and have it completely disinfected so that it's guaranteed free of any pathogens or viruses or anything else like that 
So that's a brand new service starting up. And um, and that's what's going to have to happen. And who's going to do that? Though? Is going to kill small businesses because small businesses are going to be like, I can't afford to add these services. And if you can't, you're going to be screwed because everybody's going to go to the, to the businesses that can do that sort of thing. So it's just basically another opportunity. We just have to stay on top and figure out. I saw um, cars.com or something like that just had some fantastic results. I don't even know what their um, thing is. We we played Carvana, who are actually doing pretty well. But this was cars.com. Where is he at? Oh, is Canadian still that cheap? Yeah. That's really tempting. I think the build is doing a lot better than people think. See, the bottom is here for the housing market, says the little that, I'm telling you, that's a good one. Hovnavian, I love them down here. We got to add them to one of our portfolios. Mission to remind me. What was they going to look for? Cars, right? C A R S. There they are. Cars. Oh, duh. <laughs> look at that 50% today. Um, but but still, I'm sure they're they're overall pretty. People were totally shocked at how good their earnings were. Yeah, look at that. All right, so that's a vi we you you are seeing who the virus proof businesses are. Earnings and revenues beat estimates. You know, and it's not that we expect this to happen again. But the bottom line is, here's a company that. Um, Revenue is down 4%, uh, adjusted earnings, blah, 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 estimates, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's a company, they're not losing money. That's the key. They weren't losing money. They're a profitable company. Not last year, but <laughs> in previous years, they are capable of making money. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, again, I don't follow them, but they're only, they're only market caps at 460 million. They were 200 and something million dollars like yesterday or a couple of days ago. They were like so low. And where, where do we put their thing? Here. Look at this. They were down at four bucks. So, and this is what you got to look for because you got to look for companies and say, look, here's a company. <clears throat> Here's a company priced, you know, forget, yes, forget 200 million, but they price now at $400 million, okay? And they're capable of making $200 million in a year. Why didn't they make it here? I don't know. I have to find out. I have no clue as to how this company works or what they do. But I generally, I like the business model. So it's like, I think that probably they're expanding or doing something or investing. And obviously they went headlong into like the worst time they can possibly do the investment. But meanwhile, it worked out because they actually did make some money. They probably would have made a freaking fortune if it wasn't for the virus. So here's a $460 million company that can make 200 million or more a year. 50% of the company's value can be made in profit. And People are only just waking up today because of the earnings. Could have seen that. I could have seen you could have seen that before earnings. You say, what are they capable of? So what's going for? Let's see if they have any estimates. Yeah, see, going for they expected they expected to make a dollar a share next year, up to two dollars a share next year. It's ridiculous. So, you know, that's what you want to look for. It's like you want to look for bargains. There's tons of companies like that right now because people just, they 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 have wacky ideas of like it's never going to come back. And what's Carvana? Uh, Car Ow. Carvana. Oh, CVNA. Then there's, wow, oh, that's not right. CVNA. <laughs> So then you have Carvana and also popping back up. Wow, they didn't, they're still expensive. CVNA. They didn't get that kind of hit. Now, Hobnavian, Hobnavian has, has many times in the past lost a billion dollars. They, they make, you know, they're a cyclical company. They make a billion, they lose a billion, whatever. But meanwhile, you can buy the entire company now. Let's find it. 
I, I think they're in the hundred millions too now. Oh, Sixty-four million dollars. <laughs> it's funny. It is. I mean, look. Oh, well, you're not gonna you're not gonna see it on here, are you? Aha. They haven't made. Oh, yeah, they did. Here you go, right there. They made four point five billion dollars two years ago. Last year they lost forty two million dollars. So you gotta wait. That looks like they lost forty two billion dollars. That's not the case. I'm fairly positive they didn't lose forty two billion dollars. These are in oh, these are in thousands. Okay. Wait, all numbers in thousands. Sorry. They lost forty two million dollars. They made Four thousand million. Wait, four thousand thousand. Sorry, they made four point five million dollars. Let's see. Can get something longer on these guys. Well, you can't go. You can't go far enough back to see when they made money. Once upon a time, though. These guys made billion dollar, had billion dollar profits in a year. Okay, just not lately. Uh, net profit, they had th here's where they made $307 million. That is actually $4.5 million only. They lost 30, lost 40. Okay, they lost 300 million here. Three, three, two. Are these millions? I'm, I, I'm sure these are millions, so this should be 300 million. But they lose it because they're right off the land, they'll buy land, they'll write off land, they've got houses, they write off their inventory. It's not a cash issue so much as it is just their, the way they do their, their accounting. And the point is though that the potential is there for them to make a huge amount of money. They could have a positive year where they make $300 million. And you're buying the whole company for $66 million. So as long as they don't go bankrupt, you're going to probably get yourself five to 10 times your money back at some point. So, you know, and they're not, they, they're not necessarily the best ones. You know, it's hard to tell who the best is right now. You say KB Homes is another one I like. But I think Hubnavian, I happen to, you know, I, I know Hubnavian well, and they're in the Northeast, and I think that they're going to bounce back nicely. Um, KB Home just hasn't gone on sale the way they do. But here's KB Home, 2.5 billion uh, thing, and they make 2 billion, they make 200 million a year. So they were running about 10 times earnings. And you can see here in a good year, they'll make a billion bucks. There's, the, you know, you, you just got to look at all these cyclical industries and people who are impacted by the virus, but not impacted in such a way. In other words, Hovnavian is a land bank. KB Homes is a land bank. They've got, the, when they have no sales, when they have costs, what are their costs? It's because Hovnavian or KB Homes, they're constantly buying land to develop. They develop the land. That's a money sink while they're developing the land. At some point, they start building the homes also very expensive, right? And then they have to sell the home. So there's a big, long cycle. You guys know this. You've, everybody's seen a development go up, right? A development, that's what these are. These guys are developers. They're not, they're not like uh, Century 21 or something like that. They're not selling homes. They are the people who build the homes and develop them. So they go through a process between the time they buy the land, get the permits, um, uh, build the infrastructure for the neighborhood and then they put the plots of land out and then they build the model homes and then they start kind of like selling and building at the same time the model homes but it's a three four year process before they start getting any money back on the on the development that they've got and 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 they have to finish selling development before they really have any profit before they pay off the land and they finally start making profits on the homes so very long, very terrible cycle. And when it gets to, when it gets interrupted by a year or something like by something like this, or it's a cycle they have to constantly be going through. And they can't help what the economy does in between. So some years 
the economy's good, they sell a lot of homes, blah, blah, blah. Some years the economy's bad and their homes sit on the market longer. If their homes sit on the market longer, their debt has to still be paid. They still accrue interest and so on and so forth. They still got to keep some of the developments moving forward. They have contracts, they promise to build things regardless of the economic climate and conditions. And so they're going to have good and bad years that are fairly out of their control. It's not because they're mismanaging their business. It's just they have to ride, they have to roll with the changes in the economy. They are a cyclical business, just like many, just like Caterpillar. Cyclical, can't help the economy, got to do your job, got to be there for the good times and the bad times. Investors, traders, I don't want to call them investors, traders have no patience for that kind of thing anymore. And they won't pay up. But that's what our job is. Our job is to find the stuff people don't want. We're, we're bargain hunters. If you're going to be a value investor, you're a bargain hunter. Just like going to the antique road show, you're going to look at 500 antiques and you're going to pick the one or two that you know, not that you think, that you know are underpriced. So you say, oh, I don't think people realize this is actually Wedgwood China and therefore I'm going to buy this tea set for 30 bucks because it's wet, it's legitimate Wedgwood crystal, I mean, China, whatever. Um, some people know stuff and some people don't. And a and hundred people at an antique show will pass by, uh, you know, that blue Wedgwood uh, pattern in China. A um, hundred people pass that by, or they'll say, oh, it must be fake and blah, 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 and this and that. But if you know what you're doing, Wedgwood, China, that stuff. So if you know what this is, and it's common stuff, but it's it's worth good money. People collect them. Everybody's got it. I mean, it was it, this was the number one thing. It doesn't matter anyway. But that was this was like the top thing you could buy at at a certain time. Here, this one was eighteen thirties worth of fortune. But when you see this blue, so if you know anything about it, most people don't, obviously. <clears throat> I know about it because my grandparents used to like it. But if you see that, you say, oh, that's worth money, as opposed to 90% of the crap that's not worth money when you're at a flea market. And if you recognize that and the person selling it doesn't recognize it because it's just something their grandparents had in the attic and they had and they ended up getting it for a wedding or something like that. And it's been sitting in a box for 20 years. And now they're and now they're moving and they're getting rid of this stuff. And they and they got this China tea set. And they're like, who who drinks tea? I do actually, but <laughs> so they say, who drinks tea? So they're selling the whole set for like 50 bucks and it's worth a thousand bucks. That's that's recognizing value. That's all it is. And it's no different when you're buying stocks. We recognize the value. We recognize the potential. You can't go, you have to know things other people don't know. And 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 you learn it by happenstance. You have maybe you worked in the industry, maybe you understand some industries better than others. And you um and also you learn by studying, by practicing, by getting used to what things are. I mean, people who go, you know, just like anything else, it's like if you go to the if you go to these uh, uh, antique shows and you are a, a good bargain hunter, you start to learn what kind of things you're good at recognizing. Not, it's not always going to be everything. I used to, when I was a kid, um, about 11 years old, I had a paper route and I made some money, 10 years, 10 when I started. Um, but when I was 10, I used to just buy comics and, um, you know, I used to buy, I used to buy and to read them. So I used to take my paper route money and I would buy comics and I would have a big pile of comics. Then I think I went because there was some kind of comic show, but I went to, I went to like a flea markety kind of thing where there were comics. And I saw all these comics that were being sold for like, not, not less money than they were originally for, but more. And I became like totally fascinated by that concept that I could buy a comic and sell it for more money than I bought it for. And all I had to do was put it in plastic and and uh, and sell it. And, and, and certain people wanted certain comics, so they would pay extra for it. Um, then I started realizing that if I bought a number one comic, it was worth more than if I bought a number 121 comic. So I would start 
I would start purposely when I'm picking out comics. I wouldn't just pick up a comic because I wanted to read it. I would pick up a comic because I thought it would be valuable for resale. So then I started doing that. I would bring those to the things and I would start making money selling comics. Then when I'm at the shows, I started realizing that people mispriced their comics. That some people didn't realize the value of the comics they had, while other people would pay extra for this for a comic. So I started being basically a broker. I'm like 10, I'm 12 years old or 11, 12 years old, and I was being a comic book broker. And I would go to I would go to one flea market and I'd buy some comics. I go to another one and sell the comics I just bought at the other place. And I was making good money doing that too. But it's just it, it all starts by doing something you're interested in, doing something you have some knowledge of. And then, and then by practice, expanding your knowledge. And I'll tell all you guys, as consumers of financial information, which you are, um, you're doing, you can't just do whatever people say, including me, because you need to focus on things that build your own knowledge base. So in other words, just because I say I like Carvana or just because I say I like Carvanavian, if that's not your sector, if that's not where you have expertise, unless you intend to go down that road and start learning more about it, just ignore it. You don't have to go invest in everything we talk about. There's there's tons of things to invest in. You need to build up your own strategies and your own premises to uh, to to work in different industries that you identify that you're really good at investing. That you understand these companies. So it all starts from one thing. Like, you know, I was fortunate because my grandfather taught me investing from when I was very young, and he exposed me to a lot of stuff. But still. You know, the bottom line is I, I didn't really trade much for myself. Um, although, although I'll tell you, actually, my grandfather, even at the time, my grandfather taught me the same lesson because he would invest in all these different companies and he liked um, the coal companies and he liked this and that, you know, when I was a child, it was 40, 50 years ago. Um, so he would invest in the in utilities. He liked the, the, the industry companies. He liked... Um, uh, he liked certain retailers because he was a retailer. He had a he had a store in London, and he knew everything there was to know about retailing and shipping and imports and exports and blah blah blah. And he would tell me all about that stuff too. So I started to learn that stuff. But when I started doing my investments, in fact, the first stock I ever bought, my grandfather said, "Here, I will." You know, he goes, "Here, we're going to take a, a hundred pounds, which was a good amount of money at the time. It's like I mean, it's probably five hundred bucks." Um, so he's like, well, we're going to take 100 pounds and you can buy anything you want. And he goes, what stock do you want? And I said, Cadbury. You know, Cadbury's, uh, well, now they're, I think they're on by like Mondelez or something now. Um, but anyway, they were the, they're the really good English chocolates. And, and my grandfather lived in England, of course, that's part of that. So, so we, you know, it was on the London Exchange. So um, he was, he was, it wasn't his thing, but he said, that's great. He goes, because, you know, obviously you know about it. He was, and that's what he cared about. He said, look, let's find out the most we can about this industry, what's going on, who's making money and so on and so forth. So I bought my Cadbury and, uh, and it went up from there. And then I bought a toy company that makes cars, that makes a little, uh, well, not, not Hot Wheels, but like what they call Corgi cars was an English company. Um, and I bought British Telephone because I thought that he, because he sounded like he knew what he was talking about on that one. Um, but mostly I would buy things that were like something that interested me. And I do this with my kids too. I buy them stocks that they can relate to, that they're into. Because it's much more interesting to follow up, learn about the industry, pay attention to the news if you're into what you're doing. And so that was my early background. But when I got out of college and I started trading again, um, I went into tech because I was interested in computers because college had made me, uh, and back at the time, of course, we used to build our own computers. You know, your computer came half assembled, or even if you bought a computer, you were always opening it up and doing things with it, putting things in. So you got to be pretty techy about computers. So I was really interested in it. I learned more and more and more. 
And my first area of expertise was was in the computers, but then I started looking at the chips, and then I started looking at the uh, programming companies and the software companies, and it grew from there. And then because of that, I started looking at the retail stores like Best Buy or whoever. And uh, then from that, I started realizing the bottlenecks with the shipping companies, so I started looking at UPS, FedEx, so on and so forth. And my so my expertise grew out of my interest in one core thing. It started with tech started with computers, but then all the pieces of the computers started to matter. And then how do those pieces get assembled? Where are the people buying those pieces? And where are the parts coming from? And who's making them in what country? And so on and so forth. And then I then I started getting interested in what businesses, I started getting interested in the logistics companies and after getting from the logistics companies, I started becoming interested in, well, what companies are using these computers? This is, don't forget in the 80s. And I said, what, what companies are using these computers to, uh, to modernize themselves and become more efficient? Because those companies will therefore be dominant down the road. And that's how I, I developed an investing premise from things like that. But my knowledge grew logically out of things that I did know. That's what I'm saying. So whatever it is you know, Okay, because whatever it is you know, you don't know where it's going to lead you, but let it lead you and let it be your actual field of interest. If you randomly chase after everything some random random guy recommends, you're not going to develop any real expertise and then you won't be able to invest as well. You're much better off investing. You know, when Goldman Sachs trains traders, they generally want them to do a specialty. In fact, that's one of the reasons I never went to work for a big firm. I never wanted to because I don't want to be um, uh, pigeonholed into a, into a specialty. That's what they want to do, though. They want you to be their auto guy. They want you to be their electronics guy. They don't generally want you to cross over and do other things. Stick to where you are. They want you to become the biggest expert on the automotive industry and bring them automotive ideas and nothing but automotive ideas. And if the auto industry goes out of favor, you're just screwed. You're out of favor too. <laughs> that's that's basically what happens. There's an energy desk, you know this. There's an energy desk, there's a commodities desk, there's all these different desks where you have the experts who are supposedly know everything they, there is to know about that particular sector. They like that. It's convenient for them. The boss, on the other hand, he's 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 touching on everything like I like to do. So I, I you know, I only want to work for like Goldman Sachs if I immediately become the boss. I don't want to be. I don't want to be below that level. I don't want to be on a desk. That would bore the crap out of me. Um, but you learn these things one by one. So the, so the efficiency is though to learn and to grow your own knowledge of something. And you're not going to do that because Kramer says bye, 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 and you jump on the next uh, trend that's hot if you don't even understand what the company does. So that's my lesson for today on that. All right, what else are we talking about? Randy says, I'm going out with a mask in hand and wipes in the car along with a large bag of peanuts. <laughs> okay. I feel, that's a little off. I feel most of them have an issue to stay at home due in part to the confidence not Governor uh, Newsom. What about software, as Potter says, what about software as a survival industry, MB, MDB specifically? What's MDB? Am I missing something? What about software as a survival industry, Potter says? So, MDB, M, D, B. Oh, I don't know anything about these guys. Mongo. Another from Blazing Saddles, right? Oh, you see that? Son of a bitch. They were advertising Wedgwood to me. Look at this. One time I look for something and all of a sudden, like I'm getting advertisements for Wedgwood. It's crazy. So what did we decide these guys do? I really knew nothing about them. General purpose database platform, company office, Mongo, and subscription package for enterprise customers to run the cloud, blah, blah, blah. Don't know. There's so many companies like this. This one's never gotten my attention. I could, if you remind me in chat, I can take a look later. But you know, so what, what about them though? The bottom line is, to, you know, as a company, do they make any money? 
So no, this is a losing money company. They're losing more money now than they were before. They got 400 million in sales. They're losing 200 million dollars. So it cost them 200 million dollars to make 400 million in sales. And uh, I'm done there. I'm not, basically I've got no interest. <laughs> so I'm, I'm already I'm already totally off this thing. So what's the problem for me? I don't know what they do. I don't understand them. I, I, I mean, I understand generally what these kind of companies do, but I mean, I don't know what they do. I don't understand their business. I don't know why they're losing money and I don't care enough to do the research because it's just move on. It's there's plenty of great solid companies. You want to, I mean, I mean okay. I'm going to pay da, 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 $10 billion for Mongo. Hang on. I'm sure that's the guy. Gonna get ads for this now. Mongo. Yeah, that guy. That's the guy I was thinking of. See? From Blazing Saddles. So Mongo. So I'm gonna pay $10 billion for Mongo. Or I'll pay $1.4 trillion for Microsoft. So maybe that sounds like a bargain to you, but you know what? Microsoft makes and it's and they're not cheap but they make 40 billion dollars okay or oracle oracle is only 164 billion dollars and they make dun 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 11 billion dollars so what's more appealing the company that loses money on every sale or the company. And you can say, oh, well, then Mongo's got room to grow. It's like, I don't give a crap. Anybody who sucks has room to grow. You know, oil is up 50%, but it's up 50% from $2. It's like, it, it's, it's not bet to me. It's not better. Maybe to you, it's better. And again, you're coming in from a stock invest, a stock buying mentality. All right, because if you go to the options of Oracle, I don't have to to have Mongo go from whatever the hell it's at from ten, I, whatever ten dollars, ten billion. It doesn't matter. Mongo goes up a hundred percent, two hundred percent. If they go to if they go to a value from ten billion to twenty billion to thirty billion, obviously the stock will go up three, two hundred percent in value, right? So the stock goes up two hundred percent in value, assuming that they keep losing money and people keep buying them or whatever. But I make just as much money in Oracle by just betting they're going to keep making money. So I'm going to say they're going to hold 50 bucks and here's 2022 and I'm going to buy the uh, $35 call for, for $19.50. And I'm going to sell the, um, what did I say, 35 and I'm going to sell the $35 call for $13.50, let's say. So let's say these two are six bucks total. So I'm going to take a $10 spread for six bucks. And then I'm going to sell some puts. So let's say I sell. Um, dun, 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 dun. These guys. So let's say I sell these guys for three bucks, the $35 puts for three bucks. So what's my bet? My bet is that Oracle will stay over 35 bucks. That seems like a pretty safe bet, right? And I'm going to buy the 35 45 bull call spread for six bucks. And I'm going to sell the 35 puts for three bucks. So now I'm net three on a $10 spread. And as long as Oracle doesn't actually drop $7 over the next two years, I'm going to make $7. So I'm going to make uh, 233% on my cash. So that's what I can make betting on a blue chip stock that already makes money, has weathered the storms, is a huge customer based powerhouse, still has tons of room to grow in the cloud, and so on and so forth. I don't need the stock to double up to make to, to for me to double up, and that's not double up. It's making two hundred and thirty three percent is more is tripling is more than triple. That's your profit. Your profit is seven dollars, not you know. So in other words, it's the same thing as if Mongo goes from ten to thirty. You're gonna make how much? You're gonna make. You're gonna make twenty, two hundred percent. 
making 233% here, and all Oracle has to do is not lose ground. <clears throat> so what's riskier, Mongo, <laughs> Mongo or, or Oracle? What would I rather have in my portfolio, given that my upside of both is 200%, which one is less likely to lose money for me? Which one is more likely to hit my target? Your target for Mongo is it has to go up 200%. My target for Oracle is it has to just not go down. That is investing, not trading. If your company doesn't make money, you are, you are gambling. If your company doesn't consistently, reliably make money in an industry where you don't have any logical reason to believe that it will be derailed in the near future, you are gambling. And, and many, many, many stocks are a gamble. I don't like gambling. We don't gamble. We have a whole motto that says, be the house, not the gambler. Yet, all the time people ask me about gambling. <laughs> it's I, I don't give a crap about you know uh, you know again this is why I don't know anything about Mongo because it's like I could care it's not the kind of company I would care about it's another database cloudy company that that has this and that and blah 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 but in a million years if, if you look if you pick up the phone if I if I'm in a business and Steve from Oracle calls me and says we have something very interesting for your company I'm probably going to pick up the phone if Steve from Mongo calls me to be the same Steve, and he, and he says, we're from Mongo, and we have some interesting solutions for your company, I am almost certainly not gonna pick up the phone. And it could be a much better solution, but unless, I'm, unless I've heard about it, and read about it, and blah, 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 I do not have the time in my day to be talking to Steve from Mongo. That's why it's very hard for companies like that to gain traction, and, and, and I don't have time, and my IT guys don't have time, and nobody has time. You know, these companies these days, and, and a lot of you guys who are older, and I'm older, but I'm, I'm a little more, you know, I work with a lot of startups. Um, things aren't like they used to be. There are very, very few people who get paid to sit around at a desk all day, you know, with those clacky balls going back and forth and whatever. It's like most, you know, there's, there's not as much fat as there used to be in companies. And it used to be a lot easier if you were an unknown salesperson to find somebody who was willing to talk to you. And then that person would then feel that if they, if they thought your idea was good or your solution was good for them, they would then feel like that was good to bring to the boss because they would feel it would make it seem like they were doing something, that they weren't literally taking up space in an office like I'd say half the people in offices were back in the day. You know, you could, you could in, in most offices, because I used to be, I was, an, I was an organizational consultant, and in most offices, you could literally throw half the people out, one third for sure. There's very few places you can go to where you couldn't have gotten rid of one third of the people and still have the same functionality as the office. That was just the way office, this is just the way business was constructed 20 years ago. There was so much, you know, and, and of course you want some redundancy, you want people there in case this one or that one gets sick, in case it's flu season, people are out, in case you have a rush, some businesses were inconsistent, they had certain times of year, they needed every, all hands on deck, and most of the year though, people are twiddling their thumbs, lots of industries like that, right, where, where you have a busy uh, certain season, and you're very, very busy, and you need tons of people, then the rest of the year though, those people are just sitting on idle, waiting for something to happen. It's always very tricky. So not that there's no justification for it, but you know, you gotta be more creative than that. You gotta be smarter about your workforce than that if you wanna really make money. But the point is back in those days, so many people were sitting around in with idle time most of the year, it was easy to call on the phone, do this and that. And those people also had nothing else to do. They were bored off their asses, right? You just sit there all day and the phone doesn't ring, nothing's happening, nobody needs anything. There's no contracts going on. And you're doing nothing for days and days, sometimes in companies. So when Steve Famongo calls up, you're like, hey, Steve Famongo, what is it you're going to show me? <laughs> and especially when there was no internet. Oh, my God. I mean, what the, I, it's hard to even imagine what we did back then. Um, I, I was always busy, but 
I, I know I know so many people who weren't busy. I can't even imagine any fill your time. Kind of like what we're doing now, right? People sitting home all day. Um, anyway, so the point being that that's not a blue chip company. Mongo is not a blue chip. Oracle is a blue chip. Oracle is a company that through thick and thin is most likely going to be here in 10 or 20 years. That's the kind of company I want to be investing in. Um, you know, Mongo could be really hot. They could have some great stuff. They could be cool. They could be penetrating this or partnering with that or whatever. I don't really care. If they don't make any money, why do I want to bother? I, I can make plenty of money investing in Oracle with one-tenth the amount of risk. It doesn't make any sense at all for me to, for me to go for, uh, what was it, MDB? Mongo. Mongo don't like that. And 170 bucks, how'd they get to 170 bucks a share? The hell kind of thing is that? They must have very few shares, right? Uh, statistics. Well, I guess I could probably do the math, but yeah, 48 million shares. So maybe they think they're going to be uh, Berkshire Hathaway, it'll be $1,000 a share. <laughs> And people are doing that now. You got Chipotle and things like that, right? CMG, they're around a thousand. Well, not anymore, but yeah. Oh, well, they are getting close again. Eight seventy-one, crazy. All right. So, invest in what you understand. Pick companies you're into. Learn from that stuff, expand yourself out from there, but have a, you know, have a portfolio of companies where you look at them and you say, I know what this is. When you look at uh, Chipotle, if you're investing in them, you, you look at, here. Well, oh, look what happened to Wendy's. Wait, there's a meat shortage. So why is Wendy's jumping up even though they can't get any meat? Um, how's that gonna affect Chipotle? Is it a big deal for them? So on and so forth. How many people do in the takeout? What's happening here? Um, they have a farming challenge, 20% increase in local sourcing. They see this local sourcing is bad. This is a mistake. That's how they got people sick. The reason McDonald's has like four farms in the whole country that they deal with and that everything comes in McDonald's is pre-packaged, pre-sorted, you know, not fresh, blah, blah, blah. Nothing is fresh in McDonald's. Everything is like already tested and done why they don't want to get anyone sick they decided that 30 40 years ago like we have to make sure that our stuff comes from only the farms and have the cleanest systems and they're testing and testing and testing and blah 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 blah. and frankly in these days that's an advantage isn't it um chipotle's mistake when they got people sick was the local sourcing if you deal with a thousand different farms, any farm that has uh, salmonella or E. coli or whatever, any farm that makes a mistake in your unit, and a thousand local farms is a thousand opportunities for something to go wrong, any one of them can can send bad meat or bad veg or bad whatever to or bad vegetables can send it to your restaurants and then that's it and people get sick and you get blamed they, they went away from that for a while because they were trying to make sure that didn't happen again and now they now they think they're helping people by by doing this but it's going to very badly backfire if they get people sick especially with the mentality people have now if people get sick from 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 chipotle again again Nobody forgot last time. People get sick again from Chipotle, and in these virus days, it's going to really hit them hard. I would not take that chance. Seeing Chipotle's benefiting from the CARES Act. That's these are things you got to watch, right? There's so many moving pieces now. Because you got to say, well, who, who's getting this? Cinemark. Wow. Um, so Chipotle, Cinemark, Dunkin'. Dunkin's going to be right back in business. Dunkin' Donuts is a perfect place. Go in, pick it up, leave. Chipotle also, you don't sit there. You go in, you pick it up, leave. Places like that are good. But still still not 871 good with freaking Chipotle because you're talking about uh, they back like they're all-time high.
That's that's freaking insane. And uh, this is the company now valued at $24 billion, 72 times earnings. But that's that those earnings aren't even right because when are their earnings? July 21st. <clears throat> so May, July, what's before July? May, no, June. June, May, April. Okay, so their last earnings came out April. They only covered two weeks of March. They didn't show a tremendous decline. But even so, the stock dropped off drastically. Well, they will actually, I'm sorry, they dropped in the market. Um, I don't know when earnings actually came out for these guys. But the reality is they're, 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 you know, although they're having fantastic takeout sales and things like that at Chipotle, it ain't no freaking nothing like here. This is pricing in some incredible growth, and that growth has been has been sidelined by a mile. Um, it's it's really crazy. I don't understand how people can gloss over something like that. And again, like I said, it's not they're they're not too different than Disney, right? They're going to open back up. They still got all the restaurants. People are going to go. Blah blah blah. Nothing particularly hurt their business other than the shutdown, but. They are not on the track where they should get this valuation. They lost a year. They've lost a year of growth that they would have had. So this valuation doesn't make sense when they're now a year behind schedule from where it was. All right, so they so, so they, they anticipated they would go from 4.8 to 5.5 to 5.8 to 6.7, whatever. And this estimate, I'm sure, is revised down, but this one hasn't been revised down. It's the same as it was before. And that's going to have to get more realistic. Ah, CMG qualifies for James Montier cooking the boot screen in, in short selling. That's funny. <laughs> I got to find out more about that. That's, that's, a good, that's a good sounding screen. I like that idea. But the bottom line is, look, net profit. Once upon a time, before the, before they had these problems with food poisoning, right? 445, 476, 10 percent bottom line. Okay, so if you're projecting 67 here, you could project six billion. I mean, 600 million here, and then 600 million times oh, let's say 30, because they have such good growth, would be 18 billion. But they're already at 24 billion dollars. That's crazy. And like I said, this is how they got in trouble in the first place. So I would be really careful with these guys. I don't know if I remember if you have them in a portfolio or not, but it's almost time to short them again. We shorted them, we shorted them when they were here. They actually were very good for us because they, they crashed and burned. Let's see, where are we? Um, oh, portfolios. Where would they be? If we were shorting them, they'd be in the short-term portfolio, so I wouldn't take a big chance. Nope, we've got Tesla shorts, but not um, Chipotle. And Tesla's right on track, because we sold the June 800 puts. We want them to be right at 800, and we're coming in fast, right? Already a very nice profit on that one. Here's our USO, which is all messed up, because this is, you can't, oh, ah. You can't go by, the, I gotta, these numbers haven't been adjusted properly. They all got to be fixed. Hope that's not giving us a big profit we don't actually deserve. Um, well, there's not much in here. There's not like it's really basically just the hedges. There's very little in here that's not the hedges. So the short-term portfolio can't really tell what it is, but it's probably up about 400%. Long-term portfolio. Thirteen point six percent. That's not bad because that works out to five sixty eight. So if this is a five sixty eight and the other one's a five hundred, we're up around one point one million still. That's very good. It's a lot of positions. Twenty two spreads. We have twenty two positions here, and we have fourteen short puts and a couple of miscellaneous. But all in good shape. Look at all these. Freaking every put we sold is doing well. Except for tenant healthcare, which I said I, I said I thought we should cut. See? I had a bad feeling about them because the hospitals, we just had an article on that. 
yesterday, today, I'm going to say yesterday. Uh, da, 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 da. What? Oh, huh, that's weird. Oh, it's a reprint. That's why. Silly me. So back on April 24th, I said, I'm not sure hospitals making money as they have to turn the entire place into biohazard wards and they can't do profitable surgical work, right? So that was my thought um, on the 24th. Um, H O S P T. Oh. Anyway, I did recently see an article. Maybe it was today. I thought I posted it, but I just saw an article saying that some hospital had disappointing earnings. Control of S H O S P hospital. Nope. Well, maybe if we look at Tenet Healthcare, it'll be under their news. THC. Down 7% today. Oh, yeah, they just had earnings. That's why. Um, earnings beat estimates. Oh, they're not so bad. Why are they, so, why are they off so much? And in healthcare, detailing coronavirus impacts on hospitals. It rises. Well, that didn't work out, did it? They repeated a quarterly profit two days ago compared to a loss. So what's the problem? Strong operating performance through mid-March ahead of expectations, pandemic in later half, suppressed otherwise solid financials, lowering net income from operations. Yeah, that's what I mean, that's what I thought though, that it was gonna hurt them actually. Um, da, 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 da. Actively managing COVID-19 patients, adapting rapidly involving, uh, companies hospitals not overwhelmed. Um, patient volumes declined significantly in the latter half of March due to shelter in place. That is true, everybody's, I mean, nobody's going to the hospital. I mean, people, aren't, well, first of all, people aren't being hurt in accidents. So much so that the insurance companies are giving money back to the customers. Um, not, not, not health insurance, apparently, but life insurance are giving back. I mean, uh, auto insurance. Um, so they're pulling guidance and so on and so forth. But anyway, the bottom line is, as I, as I thought, though, at the time, that, that this is a bit dangerous when you're considering pulling that out of the portfolio. Um, in that case, though, it's just in, uh, was it here? It's just a short put. I think if we had a full position, I'd be more worried. I'm not worried if it's just a short put. But I think we do have them in another portfolio where it's not just a short put. Walgreens, on the other hand, just had good earnings and and, and not really being rewarded for it. Um, CVS just had great earnings. Or maybe it was CVS and Walgreens didn't announce yet. Yeah, but CVS. So they, they popped back up from their announcement. Walgreens, I'm not sure, actually has the earnings. See, this is how I like to gamble. I pick stocks that are good, that are beaten down. And I bet that some at some point, people are going to uh, pick to hit them. Uh, oh, earnings are late, that's why. So CVS just had their earnings, maintains their profit forecast. And Walgreens hasn't had a chance to say anything yet. So we've got to wait till June. We've got to wait to see. But I like these guys down here so much. This is one I banged the table on for ages. So this is this is our buy point for sure. We like them around 40 bucks. Oh, what else? What else was? Okay, let's take a look at the EIA. There you are, petroleum status report for oil. See how that's doing. Is this today, May 1st. What's today? May 6th, right? Okay, it's the right one. Um, commercial inventories increased by 4.6 million barrels. That's not terrible. Um, 
but this time gasoline decreased by 3.2 million barrels. What? This is the right report, right? So look worse before. Now I'm confused. Um, plus 4.6 minus 3.2, that is correct. Okay, I did not catch that before. Um, finished gasoline and blending uh, components inventories both decreased last week, distillate increased by 9.5. Now, what about other oils? Other oils, which they never talk about, went from four. Oh, see, so you got a seven million build in other oils. That's one thing you got to pay attention to. What else happened? Um, notice, notice production is way down from last year. They produce so. So look how much less they're producing every day. They're producing fourteen. That's five. So, ugh, hurt my brain. Um, that's 4.14.5 of 20, five, oh, excuse me, 5.5 million barrels less per day is being produced. So keep that in mind, keep it in context. We are having this kind of build in oil, even though they're producing 35 million barrels less of product per week. 35 million, 30, 38 million really, 38 million less barrels are being produced each week and we still have a build. That is crazy. Refineries are running at 70% of capacity. They're running at 90% of the capacity less. They said 20% of our production capacity is offline. Um, you can see it. Wow, there it is. See, look at gasoline. Nine point nine million per day last year. Six point three million per day this year. Twenty one million less barrels of gasoline are being produced every day than than last year. No, I'm sorry, every week than last year. There's still a build of other products. So that's where they're hiding some of the build and manipulating the prices now. And uh, we're exporting still a massive, ex last year we were only exporting 2.7 million barrels of refined product. Now we're exporting 3.5. So we're exporting an additional 800,000 barrels a day. So another um, uh, 5.6 million barrels a week are being exported. So 5.6 million more barrels are being sent out of the country and um, the all other oils, 7 million barrels this week was sent into all other oils. Uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, not very much, no, no factor there. We had actually more in the reserve last year than we do now. They still, they stuck about a million something barrels in it. That's not very much though. Um, <laughs> price wise, 61, 62 bucks last year, 1972 this year. That is awful, right? Wow. Gasoline, though, 280 down to 180. So gasoline's only gone down a third. Oil's gone down. Oil's down 75%. Gasoline's down a third. Yeah, so there's a big disparity there. But that's that's really good for our friends at Valero, who is one of our people we did invest in. Look at Valero go. See, and what and again, this is just a matter of it's if you know something, this is an industry I happen to understand very well. So we somehow we invested in Valero. Here's Exxon. We must have Valero somewhere else. I know we do have Valero. Is it in the uh, options opportunity portfolio? Um, but anyway, so we sold the Exxon when it was down on 318. And I think they went lower. I don't think I caught the exact bottom there. XOM. Oh, no, that's pretty good. So on March 18th, we sold the Exxon puts. And what did we do? So Exxon, so Exxon goes down and down and down and down. And I say, well, you know what, Exxon, I happen to know about Exxon, that they they obviously, you know Exxon has refining, right? They have refining. They've got gas stations, don't they? Like Valero, refining and gas. That's a big part of their business. They also have a chemicals division where uh, gasoline and or oil, sorry, where oil, petroleum, 
and natural gas are the input cost for them and the output is the chemicals they sell. So if oil and gas go down, this is why Exxon does it, if oil and gas goes down, they then sell the chemicals to other people and make a nice profit there. So they've got different ways of making profits in different environments. So I like them as they rounded out. So when they went down to 35-ish on March 18th, what did we do? We sold the 2750 put. So we take another 750 off 35, another 20% lower than what I thought was the bottom. And it did turn out to be the bottom. And we sold the puts. We sold them for almost seven bucks. So our net input, our net on, on Exxon was $20.50. So our worst case is we own 3,000 shares for 20 bucks, for 2050. That, that would be our worst case. We sold it for $20,000 because I was extremely super confident in this one, of course. And um, and it's already up 11,000, it's already up um, $9,000, it's up about 50% already. But I, I, would, I have no reason whatsoever to buy these back early because I don't think in any way, shape or form, Exxon's going 2750, let alone 2050. So it's just free money. And it's either free money or it becomes a busy or Exxon becomes a long-term position in the long-term portfolio. But generally, I expect it to be free money. You take advantage of things, but you can do that when you know a certain sector or an industry really well. That's that's the key to what I was talking about before. Because I know Exxon like the back of my hand. In fact, back in the, you know, back in the old days, I used to trade energy constantly. Um and you know where that came out of? I stopped my story at that point, but I said, I learned about the shipping, right? You learn about the shipping, what's the major cost of shipping? Fuel. So because I was learning, because I learned, because I liked computers, I learned about chips. Because I learned about chips, I had to find out about um, where they came from. And because I found out about where they came from, what the supply chain was, I found out that a lot of the chips were being slowed down because of shipping restrictions. So then I started learning more about the shippers and I got interested in that. But then I learned about fuel and the cost of oil and how it fluctuated. And that became interesting to me. So I started studying a lot of that stuff. Plus, my cousin for a while was a big energy trader in the Middle East. Um, so we used to talk about it all the time. So I got to know that industry very, very well. And Exxon, I used to play Exxon. I used to play all the oil companies all the time. In fact, it was one of the things we were famous for back in the day. Um, back in back about 10, 15 years ago, that was one of the things I was famous for when I started my newsletters was uh, my oil, my energy trades. <clears throat> and oil went up to like 100 at some point around there. And so that was crazy. And uh, we and I used to say how insane it was and how it was all going to crash, <laughs> which, it, which it did obviously several times since. But, you know, there's, there's just a limit to how much people can afford to pay for stuff. But there's also a limit. There's, there's a top upper limit of oil is about a hundred bucks a barrel. A hundred bucks a barrel alternatives become more attractive. Uh, when oil gets down to twenty dollars a barrel, though, it's not feasible for enough people to produce it at twenty dollars a barrel to meet the demand for oil. Therefore, it can't stay there. It can't physically cannot stay there. There's a limit to how long people are going to be able to pull oil out of the ground at a loss when. You know, if there was no demand, that's different. But this isn't no demand. In other words, this isn't like um, this isn't like uh, uh, buggy whips, right? Like at, at one point, everybody had a buggy whip because everybody had a buggy. That was how you got around. You got around with a horse or a buggy, and you had to whip the horse, and therefore you owned a buggy whip. Okay, cars come along, no horses, no buggies, no whips. <laughs> okay, that's an industry in permanent decline. Okay, that's an industry that dwindles out of existence, and now good, good luck finding a buggy whip, right? <laughs> it's just not a thing. I don't know if you go like Amish County or something like that. Um, Exxon sells gasoline. Yes, gasoline's in decline. I've been saying that for years, right? So there's a decline, but it's a slow, steady decline. It's not zero. And there is a constant demand. There is a usual normal demand for... Um, For 20 million, there's generally, there's a demand for 20 million barrels. Now, maybe the demand is no longer 20. Maybe the demand is not, it's probably not 14 either. Maybe the demand is probably around 16, 17. Maybe it's dropped 10% and it's never going to come back. But you know what? You can't produce 90% of the oil that we produced last year for 20 bucks a barrel. 
too many people are underwater at that price. They're losing money. That's the thing. You, ha you don't have no demand. You do have demand. Therefore, there is a certain price that's going to meet that demand, and that price is not $20. That's how you can play the market. You can play the bottom of the range. You can play the top of the range. You know when it's too cheap. You know when it's too high. When it's in between, don't play. Do something else. So demand materials have tops and bottoms. Um, copper, you use in piping, right? Copper is used in, in piping, very heavy in buildings and so on and so forth. Although, what's killing copper? PVC. Not all piping is copper anymore. In fact, most, most piping is no longer copper. But copper is used heavily in turbines now because any, any electrical generation is copper. So electricity is being used in a lot more things. Copper is being used in a lot more things. Still has a purpose. Um, you know, they, but they use, you know, there are certain supply and demand levels for things that you see. Gold, for example, when gold was getting down around 250, the reason we went long in gold is because I said, you know what, when you get to $250, you hit the point at which gold is worth using for electronics. It's, it's unbelievably efficient as a conductor, but not when it's a thousand bucks an ounce. But when you're down at $250 an ounce, it is so much more efficient than anything else you could be using that it's worth using it and upgrading your electronics. Because you use very, very little gold to actually make wiring and make platings and things like that for connectors. But if you do that, you're gonna get unbelievably better efficiency than with the stuff we usually use. But the problem is, that's not what people are do. Your phones have a gold, have a lot of gold in them, actually. Not a lot, I mean, like, a, you know, a, a milligram, but the point is it's quite a lot for electronics. Um, in fact, there's a whole business of people who take phones, scrap them, and, um, and pull the gold back out. A, that's a big recycling business because there's uh, uh, enough gold there where it's actually worth mining the phones for gold. Because when you need efficiency, and you certainly do need efficiency inside a tiny little phone that has to run like a computer, there's no substitute for gold. It's the best. Um, so there, there is an actual bottom for gold. Why? Because suddenly a different use for it kicks in. Something that you wouldn't normally want to do with it, but because you're saying, well, for that price, I'll use it. And that was a long time. When, when did that happen? It was so long ago. Back here. Yeah, back in the big, back in the in the 9/11 crash. So down around here, we had the spike in here. That wasn't when it was. It was when it crashed after 9/11, or or the other crash, whatever the market crash was. That's when we were like gung ho on gold. So I was like, this is a ridiculous price because you can actually use it for stuff. And of course, that's it. That is the base. And you say, why is you know why did we why did we bottom out here? Because it starts getting industrially interesting to use gold down here. You know, not not here. Now it's got to now it's got to go up on its own basis. But when you're down here, it's got plenty of reasons to use gold for all sorts of things. So again, it goes back to understanding the market. And then when we got to uh, to around here, um, my premise for gold not going lower at this point was I was saying this is how much money it costs to pull gold out of the ground. And and what happened is over the next ten years. Gold got more expensive to pull out of the ground. There was big demand for gold for a while. During this time, they depleted a lot of mines. That means the next batch of mines, because obviously you deplete all the easy mines first, right? So you deplete the easy to get gold, then you have to move on to the hard to get gold. By this time, the cost of pulling gold out of the ground was roughly $1,000 an ounce. So as gold got towards $1,000 an ounce, we got gung ho on gold again. Now it wasn't because of the demand, because you're never going to see that again, it was because, so you're never going to see gold heavily used in electronics again, but it was because here, once you get down to 10, 50, 10, uh, thousand bucks, you just can't simply get it. Nobody does it. Barrett gold, the reason, and the reason I like Barrett gold, who's our stock of the year this year, is because they are the lowest cost producer. They pull gold out of the ground at, at like $800 an ounce. They have for many, many years always bought the cheapest, lowest cost mines. So they have a lower cost of production than any other gold supplier. They also are the biggest gold supplier. So they've got 
the most mines with the most production at the lowest cost per ounce coming out of the ground. That gives them a huge advantage over their competition. And that's why I like those guys whenever they're cheap. They're not cheap anymore, but they were cheap in November. When, when, when I liked them back here in November, I was like, that's a good price. I, that was, that's why they became the stock of the year. Stock of the year isn't, you know, when we do a stock of the year, it's not a stock that's going to go up. I don't care if the stock even goes up, frankly. It's usually something that's going to increase as we get better leverage. But the point is, what is a stock that I think we can make a play on that is most likely to give us a 300% return? Over, over two years, like when the 2022s. And in this case, it was Barrett Gold. I said, this stock is almost certainly not gonna go lower. I was wrong, it went quite a bit lower in March, but not for, not for more than a couple of days. But it did go lower, but I said 18, and you can see and you can see how 18 is a good floor, right? Other than the spiky down thing, 18 held up very well. So in November around Thanksgiving, I said 18 is a good price or 17, I think we were down 17 here. Because, yeah, that was what it was. Because when it came into Thanksgiving, we were so low. It was like below 17. And I was like, oh, this is too good to pass up. So that became, the, that, that's what made my final decision was at that time, at that price, it seemed great. And it looked terrible. It was going down, down, down. But that's when, you, you guys know me, that's when I like to buy something. I like to go against these chart people. And um, we, we did our play. And we have a play that's going to make easily 300%. Uh, it doesn't even have to go here. I think, I think we were basically bidding on it to be 20. I don't know. I don't know if it's in uh, the LTP. Now we didn't play it in the LTP. That's a shame. But it's certainly in the uh, money talk portfolio. Still down two percent. So that that was the original play back on uh, eleven fourteen. We had the look at this. The thirteen seventeen. Isn't that funny? The thirteen seventeen bull call spread. And we sold the 17 puts. And the net cost of that is what's that? That's 10,000 basically, and five is 15,000. It's like a six, seven hundred dollars spread. And it's four dollars times 30 is 12,000 bucks. So that that's that's gonna make two thousand percent. Twenty is gonna make twenty times the money. And all it has to do is hold 17. So that's why it was the stock of the year. It was the stock of the year. I don't care because because I couldn't even imagine how it's not going to pay off. I could not possibly tell you a premise under which we weren't going to make at least 300% on that stock. Therefore, it was the best pick of the year. That's the logic behind it. IBM, same thing. It's not about, and, and IBM, by the way, is still low in the range, but IBM, which we had, uh, well, which we picked up about the same time, because it was my last year's stock of the year, and this is us re-entering this trade, and notice we didn't sell the puts until the, oh, that's no, cool, sorry, we rolled the calls. We sold the 135 puts for 20 bucks, so we're netting in for 115, basically, and they actually went that low. But we have the one, but we have the 110, 140 spread. We rolled that. That wasn't as low as that before. But the net of this thing right now is these two cancel out. So it's an eight thousand dollar credit. And if IBM is at 140, we're going to get back uh, twenty four thousand dollars. Twenty four thousand plus the credit of eight thousand is thirty two thousand dollars. So that'll make more than Barrick will. And all IBM had, and, and for the purpose of this trade, since we sold the 135 puts, if it's over 135, we're going to do well, but we only sold four puts. So it could actually be quite a bit under and we're still going to make money. Well, we're going to make money to credit. So if it's an $8,000 credit, we'd have to lose 8,000 off, we'd have to lose $20 each. It would have to be 115 to lose money on IBM. So, you know, it's not always about something going up for us, and we came close. That was nasty, right? That was <laughs> it came really close, and we needed to get back to 135. That's our goal for the next, over the next two years. But you know, we already cashed this one out. We it was our stock of the year, the year before, and we had already taken the money and run from at 150. 
So then it comes back down. How are we going to resist this? You know, it's our former stock of the year. We cashed out at 150, and now it's back to like, well, when we picked it up. I don't know when we picked it up. Oh, we picked up again in November. We did pick it up here. That's why we rolled. When it went down further, we rolled it. We rolled our position to a wider spread. So yeah, we took an initial hit, but now we're right back in where we want to be. All right, so let's see if I have any questions. Nope, no other questions. Wow, I must be doing a fantastic job. So everything's holding up pretty well. Um, money talk portfolio is flat, butterfly. Um, 114%, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, dividend portfolio is definitely still down. 28% down, that's a problem because why? Because so many companies are cutting their dividends, nobody trusts these people anymore. I don't know if that's going to really improve, that's going to be tricky. Um, the earnings portfolio, 81%, that's not bad and that's got its own hedges. Unlike the other portfolios, rely on the short-term portfolio. This one doesn't. The future is now portfolio. <laughs> wow, 25%. Oh, you know why? Beyond. Because Beyond is like lasting higher now. And even some power is coming back. So that's good. Hemboka portfolio. Where are we going to kill that? I forgot. Anyway. Um, oh, that's got Molson's in it. I'd still like this one. Tenant, though, I'm not sure I want to keep. Um, Macy's, I like long term. MJ, I like the way we're going. Yeah. I mean, it's not the best. Long term, we just looked at Money Talk. And the other one is Money Talk. And Money Talk is, wait, down. Did we just do that? Oh, well, I think I looked at it for whatever reason. So Money Talk is down here. Oh, it was a butterfly. I want to see if we have. Um, No, who was I thinking we had? Somebody I want to look at. Disney. Well, here's Disney. Could be bad. It's not, I mean, it's not terrible. We have the June 85. I'm sorry, 2022, June. So two, two years from now. 85, 120 spread. That's a very low spread. Disney's at 100, so we're 15 in the money. And we're currently up 39 minus 14 is like $25,000. So we're up 25000 even at this level and we haven't sold the puts we did sell puts but we bought them back at some point and we haven't sold the puts and we haven't sold short i mean, we're not selling short calls at the moment but we can do both of those and really enhance the return on that one and that's it i'm not i mean i'm not unhappy with this but oh yeah let's talk about that i think the most important thing though is that there's this list control f and who's on the list um, um, THC is on the list. I know that. There. And I think we're going to have to execute this because I don't particularly like the way the market's looking. I want to start lightening up. And so we've got tenant healthcare, which we just talked about. I don't know for sure that they're going to really make good money in this environment. So I'm kind of thinking we should cut them in the LTP. Alaskan Airlines, I think airlines too risky, too long term. Discover Financial, nope, don't, don't. Too many people are going to be defaulting on their credit cards. Freeport, um, they mine copper, they mine gold, so there should be some positives in there. But on the whole, I don't see the infrastructure kicking in. They're mostly copper, probably 75% copper is their business, so I, I just don't trust it to come back. IMAX, I don't know when they're going to get back to normal, so it's too long term for me. I don't like it anymore. Uh, LB, that deal there fell apart, not worth it. Veil, also infrastructure, don't see it happening. And the dividend portfolio, and this is, we've been looking at these since um, when was this? April 24th. So we, we kind of blew our best time to get out, which was recently. At the end of April, we had a good chance to get out for a better price, but we didn't. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't get out now. That just means we blew our chance to get a better price. Um, TD Bank, Canada disaster. The oil's a disaster. Um, I wouldn't. We got to get out of that. And NLY, it's going to take a long time to turn around. I don't want to keep it. Um, futures now doing well, so don't worry about it. Money talk, FCX and IMAX for the same reasons. Butterfly portfolio, 
I said I'm inclined to stay in. Uh, I'm still wrestling with that one. Like I said, long term, you know, long term, it's a good play. They're going to come back. They're going to come back strong. They're going to be the same company they ever were. When will that be? Could be a year from now. Uh, I'm not sure if that's worth writing out. Um, it, it's not. It's not worth writing out. You know why? Because here's Disney, right? So here's our Disney position. If Disney goes lower, we sell puts. Fine, whatever. But the problem is, I can't sell calls. It's too low to sell calls, and that's where I run into trouble. If I can't sell short calls, and I don't want to sell short calls when it's this far down on the channel then I can't make an income. And if I can't make an income, then why is it in my butterfly portfolio? So that's what we got to figure out. It, 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 you, you know, I could say, fine, I really think that by two years from now, it'll be back up, but I can't draw the income I'm supposed to be drawing in my butterfly portfolio. So I got to worry about that. Um, that's what we were. So, and then U.S. Steel, also the same problem. The infrastructure is not there. Trump starting trade wars with China again. It's not worth it. Um, Cleveland Cliff, same thing. Trade wars, China, blah, blah, blah. No infrastructure. H&R Block, okay? We got we, we got to the money, but the delayed tax season and all the weird stuff going on, can't risk it. So, that's going to be out, and that's the earnings portfolio. And then they have IMAX, too, so we take out payroll. So, we are going to execute these. Uh, especially that today is turning out so weak that the, the market's back to flat. The Nasdaq's up 1%, but the rest of the indexes are flat. And this is just not, you know, the only reason we didn't pull the trigger on them is because the market kept looking kind of strong, but now it's not really looking that strong. And these are only the first ones we're going to take off. We're going to freaking cash everything out if the market can't hold 2850. You know, we're right there now. 28.50 on the S&P is our line in the sand. So at the moment, even at 28.50, I don't trust. These are stocks I don't trust anymore. Um, as we uh, go forward the next couple of weeks, again, what's going to happen on Friday with the non-farm payrolls? How badly is the market going to take these staggering unemployment numbers? If the market completely ignores that, the next bad bit of news is going to be two weeks from now, when we find out that opening up the states may have been a disaster, that you're going to see a spike in cases that could freak people out. And that's our next big danger zone. Because if you see that, we can go right back to that market panic sort of thing that's going on. And it'll be very difficult for, to, to pull everything together with more aid and Congress and the Fed when all they are doing is covering up a huge mistake Donald Trump made. <clears throat> it's going to be hard to restore confidence quickly, and also it's going to be hard to wrangle that money out of Congress after they just dumped all this money in. And what did Trump do with it? He squandered three months, didn't didn't fix the virus, let everybody back out, and we're back to scratch again. Imagine imagine what a mess that's going to be. And I'm not saying 100% that's going to happen, but I would say it's 50-50. I think you're flipping a coin. It could go either way. So I want to maintain a certain lightness on our feet. I want to have plenty of cash. I want to have plenty of hedges. And that, that's, that's going to be our goal for the next couple of weeks. Not going to be very exciting. It's going to be safe. And that's what we want to do is we want to make sure we're safe going forward. All right. So we'll do it again next week. Hopefully we'll have better information. Friday's going to be crazy. So don't take the day off. Non-farm payroll is going to make things nuts. And we'll have to analyze what happens then. All right, but thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have some company <laughs> during the week. And we'll do it again next week, all right? Thanks.